afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the last full week of content and uh, courses, classes for the semester. Um, this week, we're going to close our discussion of political theory by thinking about the idea of political responsibility. Uh, and today, we're going to be looking at Arendt's account of the trial of Adolf Eichmann uh, after the Second World War and after the Holocaust um, and her, her theory of the, of the banality of evil. So we have two main goals for today. The first is to think about um, uh, how Arendt describes and Eichmann's attitude concerning his own complicity in the Holocaust, and then thinking about how Eichmann's behavior and actions intersect with our discussions of authority, justice, and today we're going to start talking about the idea of, of responsibility, uh, and we're going to talk about this a bit more detailed and systematically next class, but I just wanted to start introducing some of these themes today. So we're reading from Hannah Arendt's uh, book, Eichmann in Jerusalem, today. And Hannah Arendt was a political 20th century German and American political theorist. Uh, she was born to progressive secular Jews in Germany. Um, and as a, as a young woman, she studied at Marburg uh, with, the, the, uh, with the German philosopher Martin Heidegger, who was uh, viewed as one of the leading uh, German philosophers at the time. Uh, Heidegger famously or infamously um, joined the Nazi party and and, and gave a a a, spe a rector rectoral ad address at the University of Marburg in which he kind of praised the power of the Nazi, the, praised the Nazi power party as kind of like revitalizing uh, the German people. And, and, and Arendt's relationship was problematic with Heidegger at best. On the one hand, she was at the time, she engaged in a romantic a relationship as a 17-year-old with a then 35-year-old Heidegger who was married at the time. Um, and, and then, in addition, um, he, she described him as uh, the hidden king who reigned in the realm of thinking, um, but, but in face of your criticism for not condemning Heidegger, given Heidegger's open embrace of the Nazi party uh, when he was elected rector at the University of Freiburg. Um, and so there's, there's, there's a, there's, tensions here. Um, but in 1926, she, she began studying at the University of Heidelberg under the philosopher Karl Jaspers, and, and, and there she earned her, 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 her doctorate, writing a dissertation on the concept of love in the philosophical writings of St. Augustine of Hippo. And she, while she was working on her Habilitation zur Schrift, um, a second dissertation in the German academic system that allows you to get a teaching position, um, she but she ultimately did not finish writing this work because she, uh, in the midst of the Depression and the rise of the, the Nazi party, she realized that she would have little chance of getting an academic post in Germany at the time. Um, in the 1930s, she was briefly detained by the, uh, the Gestapo for eight days for anti-state action uh, before uh, she was organizing with other Jewish intellectuals at the time. Um, but then she was released and she fled to France uh, but when war broke out and G the Germanys invaded France, she found herself stateless and then fled to the United States, uh, where she taught at a number of institutions, including the University of Chicago, the New School. Um, she gave lectures throughout the country. Uh, and most of her major political theoretical works were written in English during this time period after the war when she was in uh, in the United States. Some of her most famous works include The Origins of Totalitarianism, in which she attempts to make sense of the rise of fascism and totalitarianism in Germany and the Soviet Union uh, in, the early, in, the, uh, in the early 20th century. In The Human Condition, her 1958 work, she kind of gives out her, this is her defining statement of her political theory, uh, in which she describes the kind of she wants us to think of human beings as fundamentally active creatures and not fun that, that the life of the mind had, um, has dominated for philosophers, but she wants us to prioritize the life of action, that is the life of human beings uh, engaging the world through speech and through action politically. Uh, ultimately, uh, when she died in 1975, she was working on a series of, uh, of books that would be a multi-volume work called The Life of the Mind, which was her attempt to figure to rethink the role of philosophy and to think of and, and to what the role of like contemplation, thinking, 
willing and judgment, the three, these three faculties of thinking, willing and judgment played in political life. Um, and it's in the context of the, this work on thinking and judgment uh, that she's also thinking that, 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 that her discussion of Eichmann, that these stem out of her critique of Eichmann, as we'll see in a little bit, for being ultimately thoughtless. So who was Adolf Eichmann? Adolf Eichmann was one of the architects of the Holocaust. He was an SS officer that was in charge of the administrative aspects of much of the Holocaust. Um, he did not make policy, but he um, was in charge of implementing the oper at a day-to-day -day operational level um, both the mass deportations of Jews from Germany and the tr and the forced relocation and forced um, movement of Jews throughout Europe to concentration and extermination camps. Uh, he was the one who kept the trains running. He was organized the rail system to move Jews uh, around the country. Um, and he ultimately, he, he was ultimately um, instrumental in, in the Holocaust being uh, occurring. He was originally detained after the war um, by Allied forces, um, but he was ultimately able to escape and he gained a uh, some false identification papers. Um, he was held in an, an ally, by the Allies in a camp of SS uh, officers, but they didn't know who he was, um, and, they allowed, and he was ultimately able to escape. He got these false identification papers to live and work as Otto Heinegger, um, and then ultimately fled to um, Argentina when a uh, after the Nuremberg trials, when when Rudolf Huss Huss and others began naming names of high-ranking Nazi officers that were integral to the Holocaust. Um, under the name of Ricardo Clement, he fled to Argentina through Italy. Uh, and he was ultimately captured by Mossad in Buenos Aires uh, on May 11, 1960, that the, the Jewish Nazi hunter Simon, Simon Weisenthal worked with Mossad to track him down and got pictures of family members. And they ultimately tracked him down into, to near his home in, in, in San Fernando, Buenos Aires, um, and kidnapped him, uh, kidnapped him, uh, held him, and then ultimately extricated him back to Israel uh, to stand trial uh, um, for 15 counts of crimes against humanity by the court in Jerusalem. He was executed. He was hanged on a June 1st, 1962. And I'll post on Moodle, there's actually some, inter there's um, very inter some interesting documentaries as well as footage from the trial that's available on YouTube. So if you're interested in kind of getting a sense of how the, I, of what this trial looked like, uh, I will post that, I'll post that footage, uh, those links to YouTube on the Moodle page. So Arendt begins this work, Eichmann in Jerusalem, by arguing that what's on trial here and what is, is on trial in the Eichmann trial is Eichmann and Eichmann's deeds. That this is, that while there are a series of other important questions, including the role and complicity of other nations, the, the failure of allies to prevent the Holocaust, the complicity of Jewish leaders in cooperating in their own destruction, um, that these are all separated from the question of what did Eichmann do and, and, and what is the appropriate punishment? As she writes, on his trial are his deeds, not the sufferings of the Jews, not the German people or mankind, not even anti-Semitism or racism. That for, for Arendt, it's important for her that, and we'll talk about this later when we talk about, uh, later today when we talk about responsibility in more detail, that while no one person is responsible for the entirety of the Holocaust, and we need to think about how we can change, we need to be more, change the way we think about responsibility in light of something is vast and complex and terrifying and horrifying as the Holocaust. At the same time, it's important for Arendt to not simply let individuals escape their responsibility. But he, she says that, well, obviously we cannot, the Holocaust would not happen without anti-Semitism. You can't put anti-Semitism on trial. You can't put racism on trial. But what you can do is put Adolf Eichmann on trial for the crimes that he did commit, and that, that we need to preserve the courtroom for Arendt as this unique place where individuals can still be held responsible for these crimes, um, and, and where we don't kind of look to these broader sociological explanations. Whoops. And so, so, so in the first chapter that I had you read of Eichmann in Jerusalem, Arendt describes the life of Adolf Eichmann. 
uh, and, and she just and what we know about his life is uh, is that he was not a particularly standout student uh, or, or young person that he was an average at best student um, and, and that he ultimately got his job through, through the vacuum oil company through Jewish members of his family and this job kept him employed throughout the Great Depression um, but he was unsatisfied and ambitious and this is this ambition and lack of satisfaction is a recurring theme throughout the, the throughout RN's analysis of Eichmann um, that he always wanted to en en enhance his career he wanted to move up the ladder both within outside of the Nazi party but also within the Nazi party and because of this ambition is it's what it's this ambition that drew him uh, to the Nazi party and to join the SS, that he felt that this was a way that he could easily advance in society, that this was not, for, uh, according to Arendt, a ideological argument, that this was he was not ideologically a fanatic, he was not personally an anti-Semite, he was not even that uh, persuaded ideologically by the Nazi party, but he viewed this as purely an instrumental way for him to get ahead. Um, and, and and so he complained in 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 his, in, in his own writings and in, in the trial of the humdrum of military service. That was something I couldn't stand. Day after day, always the same, over and over again the same. It's, uh, as he's quoted on page thirty five. Um, and so he he joins the SS as a way to kind of get out of the kind of the the the, the uh, con both this the his boredom with military service, but also with his um, an anonymity that this was a way for him to gain prestige and so we'll talk about his role in the Holocaust in just a second uh, but if you need to take a break this is a good time to pause the video get some water and take a break and we'll be right back uh, to talk in more detail about uh, his role in facilitating the Holocaust So Arendt in pages 37 through 40 discusses how he, he worked his way up the ranks of the SS, uh, um, again, viewing this not ideologically, uh, but as a kind of stepping stone for his career. And eventually he just began to distinguish himself by becoming an expert on the Jewish question, as, as the chapter title of this, of this second chapter uh, indicates. And he did this by becoming enormously well-read in, in Jewish life and in Jewish culture and, and, your, and, and the practices in, in society of European Jewry. And, he, and most of what he learned, Arendt notes, was uh, he, most of what he learned from were Zionist writings. So these were writings that were uh, arguing for the foundation of an independent Jewish state in, 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 in Palestine, so the reestablishment of the state of Israel. And this really deeply shaped Eichmann's own approach to, 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 uh, to the Jewish question, um, because he, he actually viewed himself as an ideal Zionist, that he, he when he began, uh, coordinating the forced uh, deportation and expulsion of Jews from Germany, um, he, and then he viewed this as contributing in some way to the Zionist project, that his goal was not to eliminate, uh, at least at this point, the Jewish people, um, but through their, his, the expulsion from Germany, he viewed that he was contributing to the Zionist project, that, they would, that the Jews would go and they would found their own state. Um, as Arendt writes um, on page 43, and this, he w then became in task with uh, implementing the forced immigration, uh, which was that all Jews, regardless of their desires and their citizenship, would, were forced to emigrate from Germany. And of course, we call this an ordinary language, expulsion. Uh, and so it was given to Eichmann in, in the late 30s the task of how to, co how to implement and coordinate this expulsion of the Jews from Germany. And his solution was to set up a system in which he would um, force wealthy Jews um, to poor, pay for poorer Jews to emigrate. Uh, and that basically he was able to, he negotiated and was able to facilitate some minor cooperation from, from wealthy Jew, Jewish uh, families and, and, and individuals to basically 
be he expropriated their property, their wealth from them, uh, and used that money to finance the, uh, the 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 expulsion of poor Jews from Germany. And and as your the chapter describes it on page forty six, this involved creating a kind of an assembly line, uh, in which he would in which he would go through and with a startling efficiency trans to, um, gather all the paperwork necessary to both. Uh, expropriate the Jews from their property and provide them with the necessary passports and travel documents to leave the country and emigrate to another country. And, and as, as um, one of the commentators of the time who saw this process notes in our quotes, at one end you put in a Jew who still had some property, a factory or a shop or a bank account, and he goes through the building from counter to counter, from office to office, and comes out at the other end without any money, without any rights, and with only a passport on which it says you must leave the country within a fortnight, otherwise you will go to a concentration camp. And as Arendt notes in this in this chapter, that the this for Eichmann became a source of pride, his ability to um, do some organize this system efficiently and effectively to uh, f f and facilitate the expulsion of Jews with a with, uh, with both the cooperation of some of the Jewish people as well as with a certain a significant amount of efficiency that he was able to create an efficient system of disenfranchisement and expul expulsion. And for Eichmann, that this he viewed this as like him contributing his unique knowledge and his unique talents uh, to, to this as a way that he could become recognized. Um, in the mid middle chapters of Eichmann in Jerusalem, and Laurent discusses how um, the, the rest of Eichmann's career in the SS and eventually his, his capture and trial after the war. Um, but Eichmann's career in the SS did not stop with, for, uh, with the forced expulsion of the Jews. Uh, he became, a, a, as the as the Nazi party um, shifted from this policy of forced emigration to the final solution, um, Eichmann remained instrumental in organizing and implement, implementing this. He coordinated the forced expulsion of Jew, uh, Jews from Germany, um, where it, when it moved from this policy of um, basically uh, required immigration to uh, rounding up uh, Jews, forcing them from their homes and putting them on tra trains uh, headed out of the country. Um, that he coordinated the railroads and made ensure that the uh, ensured that the trains would move effectively and that you could put move as many people as efficiently as possible. And this same infrastructure he then used to forcibly, as the as the war continued, to forcibly use your, forcibly use the trains uh, to move European Jews to concentration camp and de camps and death camps. And so he. Content, he has, has again his knowledge and, and skills were used to, or in, in this kind of like bureaucratic way of organizing the um, the infrastructure and the procedures behind the scenes to ensure that there that, that that to ensure that this policy could be carried out with ruthless and breathtaking efficiency. Now, after his capture and during his trial, Eichmann himself pled not guilty in the sight of the indictment, in the sense of the indictment, as Arendt quotes on page 21. And, and, and Arendt continues to quote Eichmann on page 22. With the killing of the Jews, I had nothing to do. I never killed a Jew, or a non-Jew for that matter. I never killed a human being. I never gave an order to kill either a Jew or a non-Jew. I just did not do it. And so you can see that for Eichmann, he saw him, he, he sees responsibility purely in this question of direct commission of some action. That for him, he is not responsible of any crimes because he neither pulled the trigger, he neither directly and intentionally murdered anyone, nor did he give any orders to. That his defense was ultimately that he was following the orders that he was and that he was ultimately complying with his duty and obligations as a public servant and as a citizen of, the, of Germany to follow the laws as they were and that he because he was he was he neither was in charge of making the laws nor was the kind of end state of this chain of causality um, he did not directly murder anyone, that he claimed a certain amount of innocence, and not just innocence, but that he was acting in accordance with duty. And and for Arendt, this was 
why part of this is why Eichmann's case is so troubling. As, as she writes on page 26, that his was obviously no case of insane hatred of Jews, a fanatical anti-Semitism or indoctrination of any kind. He personally never had anything against Jews. On the contrary, he had plenty of private reasons for not being a Jew hater. But this is someone who was not a f ideologue. This was not a f he was not fanatical. He was not a, an anti-Semite. Uh, in any strong sense, but yet he was still not only complicit, but an active participant in the Holocaust. And he not just was a unwilling participant in the Holocaust, but that he was proud and bragged about how efficiently he organized a system of mass murder and genocide. And so this is the challenge for Arendt for about Eichmann, is that how do we make sense of this? How can someone who is so clearly not a monster, he's not a sociopath, he's not a fanatic. How can someone who is not indoctrinated with this, uh, with this ideology, who is not a fanatical anti-Semite, participate so willingly and ably in this system? And it's, it's hard, as she writes, to admit that an average normal person, neither feeble-minded nor indoctrinated nor cynical, could be perfectly incapable of telling right from wrong. And this is the challenge. Um, for 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 our end um how can we explain how someone can become perfectly incapable of telling right from wrong what what does it take for someone to become like eichmann and how can an or how can a normal person and with all of the scare quotes that are necessary here participate in mass genocide and for our end it comes down to this question of thoughtlessness that for our end eichmann was unable to look at some any issue from another person's point of view that his he was only driven by his own ambition and his own um kind of need for self aggrandizement for self fulfillment and self satisfaction that he followed that he followed the letter of the law to the t and as best as he could because he never thought about what that implementation and execution of that law meant for anyone else it was purely how can i do my job to the best of my ability to advance my own career that this is someone who suffered not from fanatical hatred, but but, um, but from an inability to kind of think uh, think about things from a broader perspective. And as she writes on page 54, that he was utterly ignorant of anything that was not directly, technically, and bureaucratically connected with his job. That if his job was to ensure was to organize a train system to ensure that. Uh, to ensure to move people efficiently to concentration and death camps, he did not consider or think about what was happening to the people that was meet, that were being moved on these trains. That he was able to fully compartmentalize his job from the broader context of the ethnic cleansing that was happening. And for Arendt, that was the real problem with Eichmann. And that's why Eichmann is so dangerous and so terrifying, is this ability that, that people, that some people can have, and that all of us could potentially have, to not think through our actions and not to think about our actions from the perspective of anyone else. Um, and this, this bled into, as she writes of him frequently, that he only speaks in cliches, that he, when he speaks, he doesn't show, demonstrate that he's thought through what he's actually saying, that he speaks in bureaucraties and officialese, she writes elsewhere, um, that he, and, and when he speaks, it's, it's clear that he's not thought about anything deeply, that he's just kind of repeating what he's been told, that he's just right, speaking in cliches because cliches allow him to not have to actually think about the implications of his actions. And she concludes on page 49, that the longer one listened to him, the more obvious it became that his inability to speak was connected to an inability to think, namely to think from the standpoint of somebody else. And it was this thoughtlessness and this ambition that for him uh, allowed for a systematic deception, as she writes on pages 52 and 53, that he was able to just convince himself that he was not only not doing anything wrong, but that he was fulfilling and upholding his duties to the highest order. That, that he was able, that he was un, because he was unable to think about the consequences of his actions for other people, that in doing so, he was unable, he was able to insulate himself from any sort of moral considerations. And so this poses us a challenge when we're thinking about questions of responsibility and questions of justice and questions of authority, the questions that we've been thinking about throughout this semester. Um, as she writes on page 246, the Holocaust is not an ordinary crime. Um, and, and, and she ha offers a series of critiques of the trial uh, throughout pages 267 through 276 on uh, the, the epilogue that I had you read, um, that the trial ultimately doesn't did not 
conceive of justice in an adequate way, that it was trying to use our normal conceptions of corrective and criminal justice to, to address a crime against the, a crime that was simultaneously a crime against humanity, but also a crime that was directly targeted at a particular people. Um, that this is this this world transforming crime on the one hand, but also we have someone who is relatively ordinary. That this is someone who is not an anti necessarily a raving anti Semite who never willed the murder of human beings and his guilt from his obedience and his obedience came from his obedience and his obedience is praised as a virtue. And so, how are we to reconcile these two ideas that we can have a monstrous crime participant? made possible not by monsters but made po but facilitated by people who are not moral monsters people who seem relatively ordinary even boring and in this for her this is where she develops this idea of the banality of evil that we think of evil in these in this idea that evil is somehow un, is somehow frightening and unprecedented and it's very obvious when someone is evil that we think of demons and sociopaths and psychopaths when we think of evil but the, the holocaust forces us and what we'll talk about next class with this an idea of structural injustices is the idea that not all evil takes this kind of form that we're from this cartoonish caricature that we're familiar with that you can be complicit and evil not by being monstrous, not by being horrifying, not by being fanatical, but purely through your banality, purely by being banal, by being boring, by not thinking about anything, by just simply going through the motions and following orders and fulfilling and following the bureaucratic and technical, doing what is bureaucratically and technically correct without thinking through any of these implications, without expanding your kind of imaginative horizons beyond what's good for you and yourself, but to think about how your how this these actions, which from your perspective may be moral, lawful, and, 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 and just, but how from a broader perspective that they contribute to massive amounts of injustice. And this isn't always necessarily, as we'll talk about next class uh, with Iris Young, the Holocaust is the is, is an easier case where we can identify the banality of evil, or we can see that this is evil, but this kind of level of thoughtlessness can contribute to more ordinary injustices and forms of oppression and domination. And so Eichmann was not an exceptionally evil person, but still participated in tremendous and exceptional crimes. That you don't have to be a monster to be participate in evil. You don't have to be a, a, a fanatic or a sociopath that thoughtlessness is just as dangerous and just as terrifying. And that's what Arendt wants us to think about. That's what, and that's what Arendt wants us to, to, to um, the lesson that she wants us to learn from Eichmann, that it is just as easy, that thoughtlessness can contribute to evil just as much. And as she, as she concludes towards 276, the trouble with Eichmann was precisely that so many were like him, and that neither many were neither perverted nor sadistic, but they were and still are terribly and terrifyingly normal. From the viewpoint of our legal institutions and of our moral standards of judgment, this normality was much more terrifying than all of the atrocities put together, for it implied that this new type of criminal, who is in actual fact hostis generis humani, uh, enemy of all mankind, commits his crimes under the circumstances that make it well nigh impossible for him to know or feel that he is doing wrong. That this is some, that, that the banality of evil is terrifying for Arendt because it'll allow, it it describes a situation where we do not, we think that we are acting in the right, we think that we are being moral and lawful, but in our, because we have not thought about our institution, how our institutions are structured, what are, what these laws and orders are requiring of us, and our willing of compliance and obedience makes possible unknown, unseen, un, prior unseen atrocities. And that's what makes it terrifying, that we cannot realize what we are doing and contribute to, to such evil. And so for, for Arendt, it's important for us to challenge the way that we normally think about evil and responsibility. That as she writes in 277, that we need to challenge the assumption in our current legal systems that intent to do wrong is necessary for the commission of a crime. That, it, that we tend to think, 
I, if you know anything about legal theory, you have to have both um, uh, intent and the actual occasion of the crime. Um, and what Arendt is saying that we need to, re we, that not all crimes, not all, especially crimes of this magnitude, are intended. That what Eichmann shows us is that you don't have to intend to do harm to be massively complicit and responsible for massive amounts of harm. As she, as she writes, quoting um, the trial itself, uh, these crimes were committed en masse, not only in regard to the number of victims, but also in regard to the number of those who perpetuated the, perpetrated the crime. And this means that in general, the degree of responsibility increases as we draw further away from the man who uses, from the, man who uses the fatal instrument with his own hands. That we need to think about how responsibility travels through institutions and travels through orders and up and down decision making structures and uh, positions of authority and distributions of justice within a society. That it is not always, it is not necessarily the case that the person who is directly causally responsible for harm is the most politically or morally responsible. And, and, and Arendt continues on. on and this is, or sorry, this is an issue that we'll take up more explicitly with uh, Iris Marion Young in next class as our kind of last main topic. And thinking about how we can think about responsibility in political systems and in political with for political questions as distinct from these this much more narrow concept of legal responsibility. But Arendt concludes, and I encourage you to look very, that closely at the last three paragraphs from 277 to 279 of, of this text, uh, in which Arendt gives her own judgment on Eichmann. And she argues that we it's not a question of collective guilt, that this is not a question of everyone being equally guilty, because that when everyone is guilty, no one is guilty. And she writes that this isn't that we are concerned here only with what you did and not with the possible non-criminal nature of your inner life and your motives or the criminal potentialities of those around you. This is not a question of what other people have done, that, her, that his intent does not exculpate him from responsibility, nor do the circumstances of, uh, exculpate him from responsibility, that he does not excuse from his responsibility for wrongdoing because of the circumstances in which he was in. Um, as he often described himself earlier in the text as a, um, the phrase he, uh, the Eichmann himself used was a, um, a leaf in the whirlwind of time, that he was shaped by his circumstances and that he was not, and, and that this was all just a tragedy from Eichmann's perspective, does not change the fact, Arendt writes, that you have supported and carried out, and therefore, or that you have carried out and therefore actively supported a policy of mass murder. And Arendt concludes the book with these words, for politics is not like the nursery, and politics, obedience, and support are the same. And just as you supported and carried out a policy of not wanting to share the earth with the Jewish people and the people of a number of other nations, as though you and your superiors had any right to determine who and who should not inhabit the world, we find that no one, that is, no member of the human race, can be expected to want to share the earth with you. This is the reason and the only reason you must hang. The Arendt, in a way very reminiscent of Weber's, is taught that, that politics isn't the nursery, that politics is not a childhood game, that there are real stakes and the consequences of action matter, because the consequences of action in the political realm are often life and death, and that you are not excused from simply obeying, because you are not, because when you, politics is not for children, that obedience is not enough, because obedience is not necessarily a virtue if, you are, if your obedience is to an unjust and genocidal regime, that you, you cannot excuse yourself by saying you were just following orders. And this inability to think, this inability to adopt the perspective of the other person, and this belief that you could determine how the world should be structured in the last interest, and who is to fit to inhabit the world, that this inability to occupy the position of the other person, to see things from another perspective, is what makes possible these crimes. And for Arendt, this unwillingness to, to both see the world from another person's perspective and to share the world with people from another perspective, from another nation and race, that that is the true terror of Eichmann. That this thoughtlessness and this inability to, this unwillingness to shit, cohabit the world with others. And it's for that reason that even though he did not directly murder anyone, 
that his obedience and support makes him just as responsible as as the uh, and even more so responsible and that is why he must bear uh, bear responsibility and pay for our end with his life for the crimes that he has committed that that we need to be able to draw distinctions and make judgments that we cannot simply excuse responsibility because things uh, that because things are complicated or things are complex or lots of people were involved that we need ways to think through and hold and make judgments of responsibility so next class we're going to think about this question of responsibility and 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 uh, a more contemporary example to think and with iris young on thinking about a way that we could actually develop a theory of responsibility uh, for complex structural injustices so what would it how can we hold ourselves and others responsible for these injustices that we participate in not by committing any moral wrong but by going about our daily lives unthinkingly so that's it. that's what we're going to be our closing our class on this question this question of responsibility and for the discussion thread posts uh, as a reminder the 200 word posts to any of the topics for this week are due by friday the 100 word replies are due by sunday at midnight uh, and for today, uh, describe the banality of evil in your own words and discuss an example from politics or history that Arendt's idea can help you make sense of. So thinking of an example that, that this, that, that, uh, of the banality of evil in which Arendt's analysis can help us understand or explain or make sense of this example in a better way. So that's it for today's uh, mini lecture on Arendt and the banality of evil in Eichmann in Jerusalem. If you have any questions, shoot me an email, drop into office hours, or um, stop into uh, the discussion section on Wednesday. Um, as always, if you're having any issues accessing the material or completing the assignments, please let, reach out. Let me know. We will can work through a equitable and reasonable arrangement for you to finish all the rest of the material for this class. As always, stay safe, stay healthy, and I'll see you next time.